October 1942, 25,000 feet above Tunisia, where the Mediterranean sun couldn't warm the air that had turned as thin as a dying man's breath. The P-38 lightnings of the 14th Fighter Group were drowning in the sky, not falling, drowning. Their twin Allison engines, each supposedly delivering 1,000 horsepower, wheezed like asthmatics in the crystalline atmosphere. Below them, 24 flying fortresses lumbered toward Tunis, trusting these twin boomed guardians to keep the wolves away. Then, the wolves arrived. 12 Messerschmitt BF-109 Golfs dropped from 30,000 feet like hammers thrown by the gods themselves. The German fighters weren't just flying. They were dancing in air, where Americans could barely breathe. Lieutenant James Morrison slammed his throttles forward, demanding everything his lightning possessed. The turbo superchargers screamed their mechanical agony. The props bit into nothing. Climb, damn you! Morrison snarled into his oxygen mask, pulling back on the control yoke with both hands. But physics had chosen sides. While the lightnings gained 2,000 tormented feet, the Messerschmitts had already gained 4,000 more. They rolled inverted at the top of their climb, dove through the American formation with contemptuous precision, and sent cannon shells ripping through aluminum skin and American dreams. Morrison watched a flying fortress take 20-millimeter rounds along its spine. The number three engine erupted. Black smoke poured from the wound like blood from a severed artery. Ten Americans inside that bomber, boys from Iowa and Texas and Maine, were about to burn or jump. He tried to pursue the attacking Messerschmitt. Full throttle, war emergency power, everything the lightning had. The German pilot didn't even bother taking evasive action. He simply pulled back on his stick and climbed away like Morrison was standing still. The American fired a desperate burst at maximum range, watching his tracers arc downward, falling as hopelessly short as prayers in hell. This wasn't combat. This was execution by altitude. When Morrison landed at Uxley Bayan Airfield two hours later, his crew chief took one look at his face and didn't ask how it went. The answer was written in the empty ammunition bays of the other lightnings, full loads remaining because they'd never gotten close enough to fight. That night, Major Thomas Bradley, commanding the 14th Fighter Group, wrote a report that should have been printed in blood. P-38, unable to maintain combat effectiveness above 22,000 feet. Enemy fighters maintain decisive altitude advantage. Current configuration is killing American air crews. Request immediate. Repeat, immediate. Technical solution. But immediate in the Army Air Forces meant something different than immediate to men watching friends die. November 1942, Wright Field, Ohio, 2,000 miles from the killing fields of North Africa. The conference room smelled of coffee, cigarettes, and institutional arrogance. Around the polished table sat the princes of American aviation, engineers from Lockheed who'd designed the Lightning, representatives from Allison who'd built the engines, Army Air Forces brass who'd approved the specifications, and one man who didn't belong, Captain Richard Bowman pulled straight from 63 combat missions, his dress uniform still showing salt stains from Mediterranean spray. Willis Hawkins, Lockheed's chief engineer, stood before charts and graphs like a professor lecturing children. The P-38 Lightning, he explained with scientific certainty, exceeded every specification. Maximum speed, 414 miles per hour. Service ceiling, 44,000 feet. Rate of climb, 2,800 feet per minute at sea level. The turbo supercharger system, Hawkins declared, pointing to a cutaway diagram, represents the pinnacle of American engineering. Every system has been tested, validated, and confirmed. Captain Bowman stood slowly. His movements carried the exhaustion of a man who'd stopped counting dead friends. Mr. Hawkins, his voice was quiet, dangerous. I've got 12 dead pilots who'd be alive if your lightning could climb with a Messerschmitt. Your specifications, your, your validated systems, your confirmed performance, they're killing Americans. The room erupted. Lockheed engineers protested that combat units were operating outside design parameters. Allison representatives insisted their engines performed exactly as specified. Army bureaucrats demanded to know how a fighter costing $70,000, twice the price of a P-40 Warhawk, could be losing to German fighters designed five years earlier. 
Through the chaos, Major Benjamin Foster from Wright Field offered the only useful analysis. The intercoolers can't handle African heat. They're trying to cool 300-degree compressed air with 100-degree ambient air. The temperature differential is insufficient. The air entering the cylinders is too hot, too thin. The engines are suffocating. Hawkins cleared his throat. A redesign would require new intercooler cores, revised ducting, recalibrated control systems, 12 to 18 months minimum. 18 months? Bowman's control finally shattered. Do you know how many Americans will die in 18 months? How many mothers will get telegrams? How many bombers will go down because their escorts couldn't climb? The committee's solution was predictably bureaucratic. Lockheed would study the problem. Wright Field would conduct tests. Units were advised to avoid combat above 20,000 feet. Avoid combat, as if the Luftwaffe would cooperate with American inadequacy. February 1943, Uxley-Ban Airfield, Tunisia. Temperature 107 degrees in the shade, if you could find any. Staff Sergeant Daniel McCready didn't attend meetings. He didn't write reports. He fixed things. 32 years old, built like a middleweight boxer with hands that could diagnose an engine by touch, McCready had learned his trade during the Depression in Cleveland, where you fixed what was broken with whatever you had, because the alternative was starvation. For three weeks, he'd been obsessed with the lightning's altitude problem, not with specifications or theories, but with the actual mechanical, touchable reality of why his boys were dying up there. The intercooler system was sophisticated. Compressed air from the turbo supercharger, heated to 300 degrees, passed through cooling chambers where ambient air was supposed to drop its temperature. A thermostatic valve controlled exit doors, maintaining optimal temperature to prevent thermal shock. It was perfect engineering. For California, in Tunisia, where the air itself felt like dragon's breath, those intercoolers were trying to cool blast furnace air with more hot air. The thermostatic valve, designed to prevent overcooling, was actively restricting airflow when the engines needed every molecule of cooling they could get. McCready made a decision that would have horrified every engineer at Lockheed. He grabbed safety wire, the most humble material in aviation, used for nothing grander than keeping bolts from vibrating loose, and used it to lock the intercooler exit doors in the full open position. Maximum airflow, always. Temperature stability be damned. Then he went further. The internal baffles designed to distribute air evenly? He ripped them out. They were restrictive. They were conservative. They were killing Americans. The modification took four hours using nothing but standard tools and the kind of mechanical contempt for authority that only sergeants possess. February 18, 1943. Dawn. Lieutenant William Wild Bill Thompson strapped into the modified lightning. Thompson had survived seven high-altitude engagements through luck and skill, but mostly luck. He figured his number was coming up anyway. And if she blows, Thompson told McCready, tell them I died trying something better than running. The takeoff was normal. At 5,000 feet, normal. At 15,000, where problems usually started, the cylinder head temperatures were 20 degrees cooler than standard. At 20,000, where lightnings usually began dying, the engine still pulled strong. At 25,000 feet, Thompson pushed the throttles forward. Instead of the usual wheeze of mechanical surrender, the Allisons roared like they'd been freed from prison. 28,000, 30,000, 32,000 feet. Thompson keyed his radio, his voice breaking with emotion. Danny, she climbs like a homesick angel. Those six words changed everything. The same phrase pilots had been using to describe German superiority now belonged to an American fighter. Within days, McCready and his crew were modifying every lightning on the field. Pilots started demanding the hot rods by tail number. Squadron commanders faced the choice between following regulations and saving lives. They chose lives. March 15, 1943. The modified lightnings met 20 Messerschmitts and 8 Focke-Wolfs at 31,000 feet. For the first time since arriving in Africa, the Americans had altitude advantage. Major George Patterson picked a 109 in his gun sight and fired at 800 yards. The German fighter, whose pilot had grown comfortable with American impotence at altitude, exploded into fragments. Lieutenant Thompson engaged a Focke-Wolf in a vertical rolling scissors. 
a maneuver that would have been suicide in an unmodified lightning. But his modified fighter matched the German move for move, climbing with equal authority. When the German pilot, shocked by American performance, hesitated for a split second, Thompson's guns found their mark. Six German fighters fell. One American was lost. But the numbers only told part of the story. For the first time, American fighters had met the Luftwaffe at altitude and won. The psychological impact rippled through both air forces. Within six weeks, over 200 Lightnings had been modified. Combat reports showed 42% fewer losses at altitude. 57% more enemy aircraft destroyed above 25,000 feet. Pilots who'd been resigned to death now hunted with confidence. A captured Luftwaffe pilot admitted he thought he'd been fighting P-47 Thunderbolts based on climb rate. He couldn't believe lightnings could perform at that altitude. The transformation was complete. The hunted had become hunters. June 1943, Wright Field. When Lockheed engineers examined a modified lightning, they experienced professional horror. The safety-wired intercooler doors. The missing baffles. Fifteen design protocols violated. This is mechanical vandalism, one engineer muttered, but dynamometer tests showed 12% power increase at altitude. Temperatures remained within limits. No engine damage. Kelly Johnson, Lockheed's legendary chief engineer, studied the modification with the intensity of a chess master who'd been checkmated by a child. Gentlemen, he finally said, We've been embarrassed by a sergeant who never saw the inside of a wind tunnel. We can pretend this didn't happen, or we can learn from it. The P-38J model, entering production in August 1943, incorporated McCready's philosophy, maximum cooling, always. The P-38L pushed further with enlarged intercoolers and redesigned ducting. Climb rate to 30,000 feet improved 30% over original models. By war's end, 10,000 Lightnings carried the DNA of McCready's modification. The top two American aces flew Lightnings. They owned the sky because a sergeant refused to accept that manuals mattered more than men. Staff Sergeant Daniel McCready rotated home in November 1943. No medals. No recognition. He returned to Cleveland, opened a garage, married Dorothy Williams, raised three children, and died in 1983, without ever claiming credit for saving hundreds of American lives. But his legacy endures in every modern fighter. The F-15 Eagle, the F-22 Raptor, the F-35 Lightning II. Each carries design principles that trace back to four hours of work with safety wire in a North African hangar. More importantly, McCready represents something eternal about America. We're not a nation that accepts impossible. When expertise fails, experience steps forward. When authority hesitates, sergeants act. When manuals say it can't be done, Americans grab safety wire and do it anyway. The lightning modification wasn't just a mechanical fix. It was a declaration of the American spirit. We choose results over regulations when lives hang in the balance. We trust sergeants over scientists when the sergeants are right. We believe that solutions come from those closest to the problem, not those highest in the hierarchy. Every time someone tells you a problem requires years of study and millions of dollars, remember the sergeant who fixed the lightning in four hours. Remember that the distance between defeat and victory. Those 5,000 feet of altitude that transformed the lightning from victim to victor was bridged by one man who refused to accept that American pilots had to die while committees deliberated. The next war will bring new challenges. New technologies will fail in unexpected ways. Committees will convene. Experts will theorize. And somewhere, in some hangar or motor pool or maintenance bay, another McCready will look at the problem and say, I can fix this. And they will. With safety wire and common sense. With contempt for procedure and love for their fellow Americans, with the kind of practical genius that built this nation and will sustain it through whatever challenges await. That's not just the story of the P-38 Lightning. That's the story of America herself. When confronted with the impossible, we don't accept it. We fix it. The will that transformed the Lightning in the desert workshops of North Africa is the same will that carved a nation from wilderness, that put men on the moon, that refuses to accept impossible as an answer. It endures across the generations, across the challenges, 
it endures.